Chapter Two, Part C of Greener Than You Think. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Greener Than You Think by Ward Moore. Chapter Two, Part C. It wasn't until I was almost at my own front door I remembered the purpose of my visit, which was not to draw philosophic conclusions, but to order my impressions so the columns of the Daily Intelligencer might benefit by the reactions of one so closely connected with the spread of the devil grass. I began tentatively putting sentences together, and by the time I got to my room and sat down with pencil and paper, I was in a ferment of creative activity. Now, I cannot account for this. But the instant I took the pencil in my fingers, all thought of the grass left my mind. No effort to summon back those fine rolling sentences was of the least avail. I slapped my forehead and muttered, Grass, grass, Bermuda, Synodon Dactylon, aloud, varying it with such key words as Dinkman, Swallowing Up, Green Hill, and the like, but all I could think of was buying a tire. 700 by 16, for the left rear wheel, paying my overdue rent, Goot's infuriating buffoonery, the possibilities for a man of my caliber in Florida or New York, and with a couple of thousand dollars a nice mail-order business could be established to bring in a comfortable income. I left the chair and walked up and down the cramped room until the lodger below rapped spitefully on his ceiling. I went to the bathroom and washed my hands. I came back and inspected my teeth in the mirror. Then I resumed my seat and wrote, The Grass. After a moment I crossed this out and substituted, Today, The Grass. I decided the whole approach was unimaginative and unworthy of me. I turned the paper over and began, Like a dragon springing. Good. Good. This was the way to start. It would show the readers at once they were dealing with a man of imagination. Like a dragon springing. Springing from what? What did dragons spring from, anyway? Eggs? Like snakes? Dragons were reptiles, weren't they? Or weren't they? Give up the metaphor? I set my teeth with determination and began again not unlike a fierce and belligerently furious dragon or some other ferocious blustery and furious chimerical creature a menacing and comminatory debacle is burning fearily in the heart of our fair and increasingly populous city as one with an innocent yet cardinal part in the unleashing of this dire menace i want to describe how the exposure of this threatening menace affected me as i looked upon its menacing and malevolent advance to-day i sat back not dissatisfied with my beginning, and thought about the neat little bachelor apartment I could rent on what the intelligencer was paying me. Of course, in a few days this hullabaloo would be all over, for though I had little faith in the efficacy of the crude oil, I knew really drastic measures would be taken soon, and the whole business stopped. But even in so short a time there could be no doubt Mr. Lefassacy would realize he needed me permanently on his staff, and I would be assured of a living in my own proper sphere. Thus fired with the thoughts of accomplishment, I returned to my task, but I cannot say it went easily. I remembered many great writers indulged in stimulants in the throes of composition, but I decided such a course might blunt the keen edge of my mind, and after all there was no better stimulant than plain old-fashioned perseverance. I picked up the pencil again and doggedly went on to the next sentence. "'What the hell's this?' demanded the city editor, looking at my neatly rolled pile of manuscript. I disdained to bandy words with an underling too lazy to make an effort to get at what was probably the finest piece of writing ever brought to him, so I unrolled my story, flattening it out so he might read it the more easily." by the balls of benjamin franklin and the little white fringe on horace greeley's chin this goddamn thing's been wrote by hand aren't there any typewriters any more did mr remington commit suicide unbeknownst to me i'm sorry i said stiffly i didn't think you'd have any difficulty in reading my handwriting 
and in fact the whole business was absurd for if there's anything i pride myself on it's the gracefulness and legibility of my penmanship typewriters might well be mandatory for the ephemeral news item but i have been hired as a special correspondent and some day my manuscript would be valuable property the city editor eyed me in a most disagreeable fashion i'm an educated man he stated groton harvard and the w p a no doubt with time and care i could decipher this bid for next year's pulitzer prize but i must consider the more handicapped members of the staff compositors layout men and proofreaders without my advantages and broad-mindedness they might be so startled by this innovation as to have their usefulness permanently crippled no i'm afraid mr weiner i must ask you to put this in more orthodox form and type it up just another example of pettish bureaucracy the officiousness of the jack in office except for the nuisance it didn't particularly matter when mr lafasse read my contribution i knew there would be no concern in future whether it was handwritten typewritten or engraved in babylonic cuneiform on a freshly baked brick nevertheless i went over to one of the unoccupied desks and began to copy what i had written on the machine i must say i was favorably impressed by the appearance of my words in this form for they somehow looked more important and enduring while still engaged in this task i was slapped so heartily on the back i was knocked forward against the typewriter and goots perched himself on a corner of the desk work in the jolly old mill what i say the old bugger wants to know where your stuff is fact of the matter he wants to know with quite a bit of deuced bad language not a soft-spoken chap you know w r i'll be through in a minute or two he gathered his pipe apparently out of my left ear and his tobacco pouch from the air and very rudely without asking my permission picked up the top sheet and started to read it a thick eyebrow shot up immediately and he allowed his pipe to hang slackly from his mouth purple he exclaimed magenta violet lavender move schmaltz real copper riveted brass bound steel jacketed cast iron schmaltz i haven't seen such a genuine sample since my kid sister wrote up jack the ripper back in eighteen eighty nine the manifest discrepancy in these remarks so confused me my fingers stumbled over the typewriter keys evidently he intended some kind of humor or sarcasm but i could make nothing of it how could his younger sister Bertie boy, he said, after I had struggled to get another paragraph down, it breaks my heart to see you toil so. Let's take in as much as you've done to the chief, and either he'll be so impressed he'll put a stenographer to transcribing the rest, or else. Or else, I prompted. Or else he won't. Come on. Mr. Lefassacy had apparently not stirred since last we were in his office. He opened his eyes, thumbed a pinch of snuff, and asked Goots, "'Where the bloody hell is that stuff on the grass?' "'Here it is, Chief. No date, no who, what, when, and where, but very literary, very, very literary." The editor picked up my copy, and I could not help but watch him anxiously for some sign of his reaction. It came forth, promptly and explosively, what the ingenious and delightfully painful hell is this goots as reported by our special writer albert weiner the man who inoculated the loony grass goots you are the end product of a long line of incestuous idiots the winner of the booby prize in any intelligence test but you have outdone yourself in bringing me this verminous and maggoty orger said Lafassacy, throwing my efforts to the floor and kicking at them. The outrage made me boil, and if he had not been an older man, I might have done him an injury. As for you, Wiener, I doubt if you will ever be elevated to the ranks of idiocy. Get the sanguinary hell out of here, and do humanity the favor to step in front of the first ten-ton truck driving by one minute chief urged goots don't be hasty 
Seen the latest on the grass? Well, the mayor's asked the governor to call out the National Guard. The Times will have an interview with Einstein tomorrow, and the examiner's going to run a symposium of what Herbert Hoover, Bernard Shaw, and General MacArthur think of the situation. Don't suppose perhaps we could afford to ghost Bertie here? Was I never to escape from the malice inspired by the envy my literary talent aroused? I had certainly expected that a man of the famous editor's reputation would be above such pettiness. I was too dismayed and downcast by the meanness of human nature to speak. Lefacity snuffed again and looked malevolently at the wall. A framed caricature of himself returned the stare. "'Very well,' he grudgingly conceded at length. "'You're on the grass anyway, so you might as well take this on, too. "'Leave you only twenty-two hours a day to sleep in. "'You, Wiener, are still on the payroll, at half the agreed-upon figure.' "'I opened my mouth to protest, but he turned on me with a snarl, "'bearing yellow and twisted teeth unpleasant to see.' Wiener, you look like a criminal type to me. Lombroso could have used you for a model to advantage. Have you a police record, or have you so far evaded the law? Let me tell you, the intelligencer is the evildoer's nemesis. Is your conscience clear, your past unsullied as a virgin's bed, your every deed open to search? Do you know what a penitentiary is like? Did you ever hear the clang of a cell door as the turnkey slammed it behind him and left you to think and stew and weep in a silence accented and made more wretched by a yellow electric bulb and the stink of corrosive sublimate? Back to the city room, you dabbling booby, you precious simpleton. It'll pay to dunce and be thankful my boundless generosity permits you to draw a weekly paycheck at all and doesn't condemn you to labor forever unrewarded in the subterranean vaults where the old files are kept. First Miss Francis, and now La Fassacy. Were all these great intelligences touched? Was the world piloted by unbalanced minds? It seemed incredible, impossible it should be so, but two such similar experiences in so short a time apparently supported this gloomy view. Horrible, I thought as I preceded Goots out of the maniac's office. Unbelievably horrible. Son, advised Goots, never argue with the chief. He has the makings of a first-class apoplexy, I hope. You just keep squawking to the bookkeeping department, and you'll get further than coming up against the old man. Now, let's go out and look at nature in the raw. But my copy, I protested. Oh, that, he said airily. I'll run that off when we come back. Deadlines mean nothing to Jackson Goots, the compositor's companion, the proofreader's partner, the layout man's love. Come, Signor Wiener, we take a look at our grasso grosso by the moonlight. End of chapter two, part C.